everyone. Good evening. A couple announcements before we get started. I mentioned Sunday I need some candy, and I already got some. Jane Bowley gave these to me a while ago. I'm going to challenge you uh, next Next Tuesday, any of you that can, when you come, uh, bring a bag of candy. And what I'm going to use it for is, you know, we are collecting candy for Truth and Treat. But we've got an event, I mentioned Sunday, coming up where we're going to be in the community as well, October the 17th. We're going to be down at the Lions Club with some games for the children. It's an arts and crafts festival that day from 9 to 4. And so they've asked our church to just do some children's games. We don't know if there'll be any children or not. We're trying to encourage our children at our church to go. And, uh, but we'll have a table with an advertisement of our church. And so the different games need candy. So any leftover candy that uh, we don't use and that I don't eat. We're going to bring it here and uh, have it for truth and treat, of course, as well. So I'm going to challenge you to bring a bag with you next week. And that's different than the, the candy. Again, we're trying to collect for truth and treat, but any leftovers will be sure and, and put it in there. Okay. You can hold it safekeeping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you give it to Charlie there. I see. I see. <laughs> Uh, also, I want to mention tonight is um, right afterwards, again, we're all the fall, we're doing our Wesley groups, and so if any of you would like to step in there, the question, the opening question tonight in our devotion, uh, and we're on John chapter 5, and one of the two that I'm texting about this, because I don't, uh, they can't come to our sessions, one is up north, and the other one uh, is working, uh, chapter 5 of John, what's really interesting is that Jesus is about to heal someone. person obviously needs to be healed, and yet Jesus begins with, what do you want me to do for you? And so we want to discuss that in the small groups this week, John chapter 5. And the way that these are flowing with what we're doing in the other activities is amazing to me because tonight in the Bible study, I want us to look, uh, make a leap from where we are in Matthew to John chapter 6, which is what we're going to be talking about next week, uh, the feeding of the 5,000, which is in Matthew tonight. So it's all flowing together, and again, we'll be in the chapel. Uh, Irene and Ray are in there, and we need to really pray for Ray, um, one of our leaders, spiritual leaders here. Ray, is, you see, he's on a cane now and had a lot of uh, trouble with his back over the years, um, and he just... Uh, been to the doctor today. I know you wouldn't mind me saying this. And so they've told me, you know what happens when you go to the doctor? They want you to go to the doctor again and again and again. More tests, more x-rays, MRI. So we just need to pray that God will give wisdom to those doctors for Ray. Can you say amen? Amen and amen. So good to see all of you guys coming in. Uh, also, the trustees are meeting tonight. You're in the office next door at 715 as well. And so I'll be over there in a little bit uh, with our chairperson and all our, our trustees uh, that are over there as well a little bit later in the evening. Um, I'm good to see TJ and Marilou. They gave me um, a beautiful card, as so many of you did, when Mom and Daddy went to be with the Lord. And um, I have to tell you, you know, these, these small groups, I was just in a small group, one of our grieving groups, and uh, some of you are, were in there. And uh, Irene leads that one for us. And... Um, gives me a chance in a small group setting to share a little bit about my feelings, what's going on trying to deal with mom and daddy going so close together, uh, you know, in that light. Well, one of the blessings of being a pastor is so many of you, your prayers and your cards and your gifts, you know, were just amazing. And um, I got a card from TJ and Marilou. I saved it, TJ and Marilou, till tonight. And uh, it's a picture from uh, Crystal River uh, over the water of the sun. Is it sunset or sunrise? Sunset. And uh, it's just absolutely beautiful. And I asked Rochelle if she could put it on the screen. And you can't see it as good up here because of the other lights. So you might want to turn around. (laughs) I don't know if you can see it much better that way either now that I'm looking at it, Rochelle. But it is just absolutely gorgeous. You can see the water and, you know, the reflection and the sun just be a beautiful painting. I tell you, actually, that doesn't do justice to it, does it? You'll have to stop by and let her show you the picture. It's got so many yellows and oranges and 
uh, oh goodness, I almost said blue. That'd be gator colors. No, it doesn't have anything like that. It has other kind of colors. It is a beautiful card, but I appreciate all of you, uh, your prayers and your thoughts. Uh, it's just been, that's been a wonderful. I appreciate it. We're going to uh, do our Religion 101. I've got all kinds of documentation um, that I'm excited about. Um, what gave me the idea is the question that Dot Chadwick last week lifted up, and Dot's not even um, uh, with us tonight. They're, they're out of town, Dot and Brad. And um, we raised it last Tuesday, if you were here, is, is it there a possibility that Christopher Columbus was a Jew and that he had more reasons for finding a new land than just to discover America or the Indies, of course. Um, that's fascinating. And that, so I've done some research. Uh, Dot gave me some more information. And so I want to share that with you. And then I have a handout in just a minute. I want to give it to you yet because you'll read it while I'm trying to talk. And so I'll hand that to you in just a minute. We'll read it together. Uh, but I would like to open up as we do each week in prayer with the cross we give out, you know, to the folks that join the church and just lift up scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that are gathered here tonight. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study this hour your holy word. Father, we always put Scripture at the top of our lives. That's what our founder, Mr. Wesley, emphasized. Um, read everything. He said, but I'm a man of one book. So, Father, we want the Bible to be what governs our lives. We pray, Father, that we would use uh, the tradition of the church over the last 2,000 years to interpret the Bible, to understand the context. Because we know we're just humans. We struggle from day to day. We're in our culture. We're in our, our, our livelihood. We're in 2015, so things are different than they were five years ago, a year ago. Lord, so we see things through our colored glasses. But Father, we just pray that we'll look at what the church has said for 2,000 years. Father, we ask also that you help us tonight in our study to use our minds. That's what Bible study is all about. Use our minds to understand the Holy Scriptures, to receive the Word from you, so that we then finally can experience the ultimate, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we give you praise and glory, and may all of God's people say, Amen, amen and Amen. Let me set this up here. All righty. Let me share a little bit uh, to begin with uh, about uh, the history of the Spanish Inquisition. And I'm going to start with, again, I've used this book a couple times. I just want to share a little bit out of John Hagee's The Four Blood Moons. You remember I've talked about that, and we've just finished uh, the cycle of the fourth lunar eclipse, the blood moon that within the two-year period has a, a solar eclipse in it. And when it affects the history of the church, uh, has to have a Judaic Christian approach. And it happened to hit at the holy festivals of the Orthodox Jews in this two-year period when these moons took place. And for this one that just took place, 2014-2015, also had the year which we just finished uh, in the middle of, this, uh, of last month, September, uh, the year of Shemitah. And I lifted that up, if you remember, last week, which is every seven years in Jewish history, they are to let the land rest since they started out as an agrarian society. And it was symbolical of us resting in the Lord. The seventh day, you rest from your labors. God rested from His. We are to rest. We are to give holy attention to the Sabbath. Well, when you get to 1492, which was a few years ago when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, other things were taking place. So what developed at that time period in, from the Spaniards was the Spanish Inquisition, but they were actually following suit of a medieval uh, Inquisition that originated years before, almost 200 years before, as a Roman Catholic tribunal for the discovery and punishment of heresy. So it wasn't focused just on the Jews to begin with, but anything that might be heresy. 
It was created under Pope Innocent III of Rome, 1198 to 1216 A.D., and later established under Pope Gregory, 1233. So you can see this is a couple uh, hundred years, honestly, about 300 years before we have this concept of the Spanish Inquisition. Anti-Semitism, sponsored by the Roman Church of that time, began to manifest itself openly by the year of 1412, when the Jews were told that they had to live in separate quarters. These isolated quarters were the later template for the Polish ghettos established by the Nazis in 1932 or 1939 to 1942 and the ghettos that Russia instigated 41 through 43. In addition to being forced to live in the ghettos, the Jewish people were told they must distinguish themselves from the Christians by allowing their beards to grow out and wearing the yellow star of David on their clothing. The Jews could no longer hold public office, could not be physicians, could not lend their money with interest. All schools and professions were closed to the Jewish people and all commerce by which they might make a living was prohibited. The monarchy took increasingly drastic measures against the Jews on March 30th, 1492. At their palace in Grenada, or Granada, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella signed a decree ordering that the, G- the Jews leave Castile and Aragon by August the 1st. This was known as the Edict of Expulsion, which banished all Jewish people from Spain who refused to convert to Catholicism. The ousted Jews were stripped of their wealth, for the edict prohibited them from taking gold, silver, and precious metals. Christopher Columbus recorded this infamous edict in his own personal diary. And this is a quotation. Christopher Columbus says, In the same month in which their majesties, which would have been Ferdinand and Isabella, issued the edict that all Jews should be driven out of the kingdom and its territories in the same month that they gave me the order to undertake with sufficient men my expedition of discovery to the Indies. Now, the, the question that's beginning to surface is why would he even say that? I mean, why did he even care about the Jewish community? Why would he put that in his diary that they have made this edict about these people when he is an explorer and he is a Catholic and he is seeking God. And, and, you know, I mean, in other words, why would that have anything to do with anything? That's what's raised some of the questions that we're lifting up tonight. God, the author says, God caused Christopher Columbus to discover the new world. I don't doubt that. I believe that God opened up this world where we live. You know, I know that he wasn't right here in Florida, of course, but I know the new world. I believe that God was involved with that. Do you? Amen. God caused Christopher Columbus to discover the new world, which would eventually become what we call America, a refuge to the Jewish people and all who were oppressed by tyrants and religious dictators from around the world. God had promised Abraham centuries before in Genesis 12, I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And we know that was a prophecy about Jesus being that fulfillment. God has blessed America because we opened our arms to the seed of Abraham who have blessed the world beyond measure. I believe the day America turns its back on Israel and the Jewish people will be the exact day in history when God Almighty lifts his hands of blessing from America. We've talked about that over the last couple of uh, months. The Spanish Inquisition, uh, which actually um, started in 14, I'm not sure if I have the right date there, I have 1483, I think that's the one, the right date, 1483, that's almost, that'd be nine years before Columbus. The Spanish Inquisition, 1483 started, was a time of tears and tribulation that would end in triumph for Jewish people as God brought them to America, America's harbor for protection. The expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492 
was a world-changing moment. The mantle of prosperity was lifted from Spain. See, we, we forget about that in history. You know, the, the kingdoms of the world, you can just see them as you study history over the thousands of years. Um, but it's interesting that at this period of time, the prosperity was lifted from Spain and began to be placed on the shoulders of an infant nation that would become the United States of America. God Almighty, according to the author, used the four blood moons of 1493 and 1494 following this as a heavenly billboard to mankind. Now, of course, the author, uh, Mr. Heggie, believes that these are the signs of the skies that God is trying to get our attention and just saying, see, do you see? I was just telling Angie um, that uh, on game day, you know, since I love watching college football, or I don't watch it, but I listen to it on the radio, I would go at night on the internet to check religious things, and then also the football scores. And uh, I got to see some of the uh, comments early Saturday morning, and the uh, one man alone said he thought that the Gators had a chance, and the rest of them were just laughing at him. Now, I'm obviously not a big Gator fan, as you might know. You probably didn't know that, but I just thought this was so interesting that that man stood his ground, and he said, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. He said, if things go right, you know, and they were saying, oh, and what are you going to say next week? And they picked some off-the-wall team, like, you're going to have them winning next week, you know, and I would love to see their faces. (laughs) Now, that's kind of the feeling I have with that with God like I'm trying to show if that's true what Mr. Hagee's saying you know it's obviously true that the four blood moons were at the time of these amazing events affecting Judaism and Christianity but he believes that it's that it's God trying to put up a billboard in the sky saying look here guys you know I love all of you can't you pay attention Uh, These are my people. These are the people that brought you my son, Jesus. These are the people that brought you the Ten Commandments that you just removed from Oklahoma State. Uh, uh, (laughs) Did y'all see that in the news? They just took them down, the big debate of the Ten Commandments at the the government building at Oklahoma, uh, the state capitol, and they just removed them today. I'm watching it on the internet there. So, I, but I gave you those Ten Commandments that help build your nation. I've given you all these blessings, you know. Uh, I've given you the church, you know. I mean, all that's a fulfillment of that. Um, be careful with what you do with my people and my homeland, you know. That's what he's saying. Well, let me continue in uh, some of my research. Um, the Spanish Inquisition, um, they were at the time, 1492, Uh, ruling uh, so many areas in Spain, in Portugal, Andorra, and the Gibraltar territory, even in the UK. They would really branched out in other areas as well. And for whatever reason, had it out for the Jews, you know. It didn't start for the Jews. You remember I mentioned about some of the other inquisitions early on from the church, any heresy that they felt was pulling away from Jesus, you know. And so even though we came from Judaism, if you're not going to convert, then you must be against us. That was the idea. But, but it, it, then it began to focus for some reason, and I think we all know why, personally, on the Jews. And we've seen that down for the 2,000 years. So they started calling the Jews uh, Maranos. Maranos. And that's Spanish... Um, term, and they were the Jews that were living in Iberia, which is the areas I just talked to you about, uh, Spain, Portugal, Andorra, and the Gibraltar territory, they were forced to uh, turn over to Christianity. And if you didn't turn to Christianity, um, they would torture you. They did they, terrible things. Um, I'm not even going to describe them because it, it's sickening. In the name of Jesus. I just, I can't, it's so hard to grasp these things. Murano is an Arabic word, and it's actually in the Arabic, and I'm, I probably won't pronounce it right, but it's muharam, which means forbidden. The Spaniards interpreted that word, calling the Jews that, that would not convert, meant swine, pigs, outcast, filthy individuals. And so they signed this inquisition to remove these people. And they did. 
And they did, okay? Look up on the screen. There's a famous painting uh, that was taking place in, um, when was it? When's the date of that painting? Do you have that up there? 1892, and it's the idea of the Spanish Inquisition, and it's the idea of what's taking place, you know, with people making decisions that will literally destroy a culture. And the world has continued to try to do that. And, you know, it just doesn't make common sense unless there is a devil behind it. The Spanish Inquisition, established in 1478 by the Catholic monarchs Ferdinand II of Aragon and Isabella I of Castile, it operated in Spain, as I said, and in all their colonies. It was originally intended in large part to ensure the orthodoxy of those who converted from Judaism and Islam. In other words, we're going to try to get them all to come to Jesus. In 1492 and in 1501, royal decrees were issued ordering the Jews and Muslims to convert or leave Spain. Estimates of the number of persons charged with crimes by the Inquisition raise range from up to 150,000 people they went after with 2 to 5,000 that they have documented that were actually executed absolutely terrible and it was done in the name of Jesus can you imagine why the jewish community struggles with roman catholic church this is, the his, this is our history. And, you know, in the Dark Ages, we all know the history that, that the church really got messed up because that's where we all came from. The church got messed up in Christianity uh, with a lot of stuff in the Dark Ages like the rest of the world and with the popes and with the uh, leaders of uh, the emperor. I mean, all of that's historical. Um, just because they said it was in the name of Christ doesn't mean Christ had anything at all to do with that. And this doesn't even talk about the Crusades, that were even worse than this. <laughs> I didn't even talk about that. That's our history. Oh my gosh, it's a wonder God didn't just say that I've had enough of this. All in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Well, the article, to wrap it up tonight, from uh, Dot Chadwick, focusing on Mr. Columbus regarding this, let me just pass it out. John, can you pass out a group there? And Charlie, do you mind? Or someone here on the edge? Oh, you may have st- you step over. Let me get Dan, Dale, can y'all pass these out? There, can you give some to Dale there? And he can do them quickly there. The question is, was Columbus secretly Jewish? And did God have a plan going on like he always seems to do when everybody else is just going crazy? Is this tonight going to prove that God is still on the throne, that God still loves people and God always has a plan to take care of folks? We're going to begin where the top of the page says, Was Columbus secretly Jewish? Now, I just want to say before we start reading this, there's no proof. These are just interesting things to look at and to wonder about the way God does things. Just like I said a while ago in in his diary, Why is he focusing on the Jewish people? As you find out, he focused on them an incredible amount. Is it possible that Christopher Columbus was a hidden Murano? Mm. Was Columbus secretly Jewish? Historians argue the explorer's epic voyage was to establish new homeland for his people as they escaped the Spanish Inquisition, that he was looking for a place for the Jews that were going to have to be fleeing to find a home. Scholars believe Columbus was a Murano, a secret Jew who feigned conversion to Catholicism. Historians say five clues to the explorer's true faith can be found in his last will and testament. Now, new theories suggest he was looking for a safe haven for the Jews persecuted and driven out of Spain. He was described as a deeply religious man who was committed to the cause of liberating Israel's holy land. Now hold right there for a minute. If any of this is true, if God was behind this, if Columbus was a Jew, a Murano, if he was looking for a homeland that would be a safe harbor for the Jews, 
If it was America, if that was God's intention, if that's the reason that we have been so supportive for the last 200 years for the Jewish state, until recently, may I say, if all of that is true, then we are on dangerous territory to back away. <laughs> I just want you to think of that now, if that is true, all right? Drop down, if you will, with me to about the uh, third bottom of the page where it says, in a further revelation. In a further revelation, historians believe the real motive behind his historic quest was to find a new homeland for Jews who were persecuted or run out of Spain. As well as his legendary status as an explorer, Columbus has been described as a deeply religious man who was committed to the cause of liberating Jerusalem from the Muslims. Jews were the target of a brutal and systematic ethnic cleansing during the time of Columbus, as we already know. As part of a fanatical religious persecution, it was proclaimed by Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand in March 1492 that all Jews should be expelled from Spain. Now, we mentioned about the charges, 150, but look how many are there. This move was particularly aimed at 800,000, almost a million, Jews who refused to convert to Catholicism. That doesn't, there was more Jews there. These are the ones that would not convert. And they were given just four months to leave the country. Turn the page, please. The remaining Jews in Spain fell into two groups. The conversos, the converts, who embraced Catholicism and renounced Judaism. And then the second one are the Moranos, meaning swine, who feigned conversion but secretly continued with their own religious practices in search of a safe haven. An illustration of Christo Christopher Columbus setting foot on American soil for the first time, but, but was he looking for a new Jewish homeland? <laughs> There's no way to know for sure, but it's interesting. The Spanish Inquisition ended up torturing tens of thousands of Moranos who were ordered to give up the names of others, including friends and relatives. Moranos who had their secret lives exposed were paraded in front of crowds tied to the stakes and burned. The church divided and took their land and personal possessions. It has been claimed that Columbus possibly was a Murano and that keeping his Jewish heritage secret was crucial to his survival. Now, you can read the rest when you get home or either when you get bored with me talking in a minute. <laughs> I just, you know, I've really studied this for the last couple of months. And, and friends, I've never heard this about Columbus. Maybe you have, but I hadn't. And it really makes me even more wonder about the blessing of America. I mean, we are so blessed over here. And we can say that we're just good, good, you know, pulled up by our bootstraps. And, you know, we're just wonderful people and all that. We're no more wonderful people than anybody else in the world. You know, we're really not, you know. Um, wouldn't it be interesting if this happened? You know, if after the flood, you have three sons of Noah, and we know that Shem became the Jewish community. We know that in the Arabic community, all right? Ham, we know, uh, and Canaanite became part of the peoples that would be conquering Africa, the continent, and other areas in, in those places as well. Japheth is a group that we're not quite sure where they went. We've got a feeling that they went up into Europe and then maybe over to the West, which would be the United States of America. So chances are that's where we came from. Well, you might say that's still not part of the Jewish heritage. Well, the Jews were divided into 12 tribes. And through the Assyrian Empire that attacked them in about 700 B.C., they were removed, the ten northern tribes, from their homeland. And they were moved and scattered abroad, and other peoples were brought in. Same thing happened with the Babylonian conquest to the two southern tribes a hundred years later. And we call that the Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar's exile. Seventy years they were in exile, and then they came back to Judah, where Jerusalem is located today. So, I mean, you know, but it was separated. Now, we know where Judah is and the other tribe. That has become the Jews. But what happened to the ten? The ten northern tribes. They've just been meandered around. There is a theory that that are the people that eventually branched into America. So maybe, just maybe, we have a Jewish heritage way back 
that we're not even familiar with. And maybe because of that, that God is looking for a place that would be a safe haven for his people. He always provides a safe haven because he always has a remnant. You have the land of Petra over in Israel. And when the final day comes, you know, and I know John's been there and some of the rest of you in your travels over to the Holy Land, Petra is within these rocks that is a sacred, holy, safe place. You can't hardly get in there. Now, I know a nuclear weapon could destroy it, but in the world that we live in, without that, that's almost impossible to get to if you could put yourself inside there. And so there is the belief that in Revelation, when God's saves some of his people when the devil's going after them, you know, that he's saving that remnant. That's the concept also of the rapture, that God has not appointed his people to wrath. So therefore, he protects his people. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they mount up with wings as eagles, run and be weary, not be weary, walk and never faint again. The idea is that God always protects his own. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, the Bible says. So is it possible again, just putting the theory out there, that God, when he saw what they were going to do to the Jewish people, and he's always going to save a remnant, he says, I'll raise up a nation. And they will come over here. I've got to send a man over there to find the nation first. I mean, they all think the world's flat and he's going to sail off the end. <laughs> so, but I know better, and I'm going to send him over there. And in that process, of course, and it's, it's a confusing process, we all know, but in that process, the United States eventually is formed. And we have protected the Jews. We have for years. And they have been leaders in our own community. You know, if we back off of that, if all this is even remotely true, we better watch it. We just better watch it. Any comments on that? I just think that's fascinating in our religious history and today as well. Dale, you got the microphone? Bring it up here for John here for just a moment, if you will. John, what's your thoughts, brother? And we're going to be turning, as John's going to share with us, to Matthew chapter 13, verse 53. Matthew 13, 53. Go ahead, John. My thoughts are this. I gave you some very anti-Semitism material to read okay for so you can talk about it a week from now all right excellent but i believe that that uh, iran nuclear deal is planned by this country yes oh wow let me let me highlight that john go ahead Are you, any something else or let me i'm just gonna i'm gonna highlight no, what you just no, said but just read about the yes. anti-Semitism okay. that's going on in this world today. I will. And see, that's the fears of the Jews that have struggled with the, the Nazis. They're just still afraid that it can happen again. And all of, all of the world pretty much said, oh, no, 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 never again. But they're, they're, on, they're online watching. Before we go to Miss Betty, I don't know how many of you, if you haven't, you need to do this. You need to go online and look up. Uh, the Prime Minister Benjamin, and I never can't say his last name, Netanyahu, just say Benjamin Yahoo. <laughs> he speaks, some of you have seen this, to the United Nations. And he is so upset that they are even considering working with Iran. And you may have various ideas, but it, whatever your idea is, you ought to go watch this. So he's there with all the leaders. These are the celebrities of our world today in that room. And he gets a chance to speak from Israel's viewpoint. And he pretty much says, how dare you? He said, we all know that they have made it very clear, and they have. I mean, that's, that's not hidden at all. They even teach their children. Iran has made it clear that they want to knock Israel off this planet. They, that, they're just, that's not hidden at all. I mean, they would, they'd stand up and say that, you know. And he said, and you're working with this nuclear process, even though we don't feel that it's going to be a nuclear weapon. He said, but you're, even the idea of the discussion that you're in this. And he says, we have needed help. And he says, and, and to stop this, and he says, and none of you, just like that, none of you, and he looks like a bulldog, please, God forgive me for that, but he does. He said, none of you have done anything, America either, none of you done anything to stand up for us about this. And he stops. Second one, second two, second three, I mean, he just glares. You know how, and I mentioned this Sunday, how you get uncomfortable when somebody's quiet for five seconds, six seconds, 60 seconds. I sat there and watched it. He just stares at them. And they're all going, 
<laughs> oh my goodness. What it felt like was a billboard from God. I mean, whether it was or not, that's what it felt like, like God was saying, have any of you stood for me? Any of you? You know, and then, oh my. Betty, what was you going to share? Go ahead. Well, you know, I was a, oh, I hate to admit this, <laughs> but I was a teenager in World War II. Oh, that's impossible, Betty. You, well, too young uh, people that. told me about it anyway. <laughs> Did they? Okay. And as we're going through this, as you're saying this, mm -hmm. My, I'm sitting here thinking, well, that's what the Germans did to mm -hmm. the Jews. Yes. I mean, it, this was like exactly what that, they did. It looks like you're reading about the Nazis. Exactly. Yeah, that, and this has happened time and time and again. And they were not Catholics. Germans are not Catholic. They're Lutheran. If they go to church if at all. If they go to church. <laughs> they did claim, you know, and uh, the, uh, I'll just say the Protestant church, they did claim the church in Germany. They did, you're but right. is that why yes. they were trying to exterminate the Jews? Well, to a degree, yes. Um, even Martin Luther, <laughs> you know, which is sad. Martin Luther did some great things for the cause of Christ, but he did not like the Jewish community. They would not convert to Jesus they held to their orthodox belief of, you know, their way. And Martin Luther wanted them moved out. Martin Luther, the great Martin Luther that started Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, you know, the Protestant Reformation. And so the Nazis looked at some of these people and followed suit. And it just shows you that the old enemy can use anybody. That's, that's scary, but that is the, that's our history. It that is, is true. scary. And this week... I was asked by a good friend, mm -hmm. this was after the shooting of the school children again, yeah. that if somebody pointed a gun at my head, would I say I'm a Christian? Mm. My answer was, I hope, hope I can so. say it, exactly. but would we say it? Exactly. Betty, that's, and I think that's an honest answer. I would hope you know, if they did this, I would, I would hope, that would be my belief, that I would hope that I would say, I will not deny my Lord. But what if they took it to your child? You know, I would still hope that I would hold on to the Lord, you know, but I, you know, I mean, that's what I would say. I would hope that would be beyond, you know, and I know the Lord has tremendous grace for us. You know, I do believe that. I don't think God, I honestly don't think God stands up there and says, uh-huh, so you're not good, you're going to deny it, you're going to lose your child, you're not. I think God has tremendous grace. But I think that he would love for us to not deny him for anything. And we do, do what we can. We do what we can, and hopefully we do. Go ahead, Jim. An, an interesting uh, item that I heard on mm -hmm. the uh, radio commentator mentioned that neither our Secretary of State nor our representative ambassador to the UN mm -hmm. were in attendance at that. Is that right? They were not present there. That is interesting because I wondered when I saw that, I thought, why isn't America saying something? Why isn't somebody saying something? I, that's interesting, Jim. Interesting. Jerry? I've always wondered if one reason uh, Hitler in mm -hmm. that genre uh, wasn't interested in the wealth of the Jewish people in Germany yes. because they had a lot of uh, wealthy art work yes. and, uh, and they and were land. into financial things very yeah. much. And I've often wondered if that wasn't so one reason that they were... That's one of the main reasons, the wealth. Jerry, you're right, and I didn't even bring that up. That may be later in that article, but it's very clear that with the Spanish Inquisition as well, that they're looking for taking the property of these people. They would even, you know, say that, that they did something wrong if they had died, and they would take the bones and lift it back up and try them, and then, you know... They would crush the bones and say, this gives us right to take the children, grandchildren's, great-grandchildren's property because of the sins of the fathers. It, it uh, uh, had a lot to do with, with stealing. It really did. Yeah. John? One more here, Dale. And then we'll go into Matthew. Yes, sir, John? Well, Thank you, I, Dale. What I'm about to say is that yes. uh, during World War II... Uh, Were you a teenager also? No, I was in World <laughs> War II. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the uh, Jewish people were really upset because the Roman Catholic Church yeah. rang their 
cathedral bells on Hitler's birthday, yeah. and the Lutheran Church, there was only one man that really stood up, and that was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer, yeah. And it's a shame that only one, one. Lutheran pastor stood up against well, Hitler. There were some others, but they did not have the popularity uh, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And if you're not familiar with Dietrich Bonhoeffer, that's, we'll have to do that as a study one night in our history. It's amazing. And he lost his life during the war. But he made a stand. And, and he, it really, it's an interesting debate because he was part of a plan to remove, literally, <laughs> Hitler as a Christian case bomb people yes 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 but let's hold that one the suitcase bomb incident to another time i think that'd be a good part of our history and because that'd be a good discussion is it okay as a christian when to make a stand and if you have to take somebody down that's a that's a we'll hold on that one hold on that one let's look at matthew let's jump right into the scriptures you're going to enjoy this uh matthew chapter 13 jesus has done these amazing miracles the miracles we're going to look at here in a moment is feeding the 5,000. But he went back to his homeland, and um, they're, they're, they're looking at him. They know him. <laughs> He's been raised there. And as you look down in uh, verse 56 of chapter 13, in Jesus, the ministry's just started. Some of the leaders say, um, actually, let's back up to verse 55. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? Aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Now, remember, James and Jude wrote two of the books towards the end of Revelation. Aren't all his sisters, verse 56, with us? Where then did this man get all these things? The miracles that he's doing, his teaching, his wisdom. And look at verse 57. And they took offense at him. You know, the heart of man is wicked. You know, it's so sad when we talk about, as we've just done, the atrocities that uh, man has done to mankind. If we just look at the story of Jesus, a man that is healing, a man that is forgiving, a man that is making people feel better about themselves. He's not doing anything wrong. He's not breaking any of the, you know, the, the, the rules. I mean, he's not, he's not killing. He's not committing adultery, he's not stealing, he's not lying. And yet, because of his popularity, it just shows you the heart of the religious leaders of the day. They take offense. Instead of going to him, and they had opportunities like Nicodemus, but even remember, Nicodemus went at night, you know. Instead of going and trying to say, who are you? Talk to us. We want to listen to you, you know. And a few did, but it was very dangerous because the religious leaders of the Sanhedrin, you know, the 120 leaders of Israel, you know, they didn't want anybody to usurp their authority. And their fear was that if he caused a troubling ripple in the tide, that the Romans would come in and either give him the authority and remove them, or just come and wipe them all out and take over, you know, because they would allow them to be their puppets. So instead of being spiritual leaders standing up for what they needed to stand up for and to, to look into these things, I mean, what, what did he do wrong? What, what is he doing, you know, that's so heinous where they would even say, you're casting out devils by the, the prince of devils himself. You must be Beelzebub, you know. And Jesus rationally answers them. Remember, he said, Satan would overthrow Satan. That, that doesn't even make sense, guys. I picture Jesus just going, come on, come on, come on, come on. You can do better than that. I mean, that didn't even make any sense, you know. And yet those were the accusations of taking him to the cross. So look what happens because of this. But Jesus said to them, only in his hometown and in his own house is a prophet without honor. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Now, I have always read that to mean that he couldn't do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. So he moves on. But you know that after studying this again, that's really not what it says. It says that he did not do many miracles there. In other words, I'm wondering if that, you know, if, if their faith is the ones that he ministers to. In other words, it's still his choice. It's not that he couldn't do them, the miracles. It's that he chose not to 
because of their lack of faith. So maybe the idea that what Jesus is trying to teach here is that I want people to come to me, I want people to need me, I want people to ask for me to minister to them, and then I will meet their needs as they have faith in me. But if you take offense in me, if, I, if I'm not your stepping stone, I'm your stumbling block, you know. And right now the Jewish community is America's stumbling block because that keeps us <laughs> from being partners with all the Arab countries. And so we're struggling as a nation trying to figure, should we let go, you know, of this great nation? Or at least that's part of the debate that goes on and on in the world in which we live. Now, chapter 14, I don't want to do John the Baptist again. We've done that a number of times, and we can come back to that another time if someone has a question. But I wanted to jump right in to verse 15 of chapter 14, where Jesus feeds the 5,000. I want to look at the story in Matthew and then compare it to John and talk about it a few minutes, okay? So if we can look at chapter 14, verse 15. As evening approached, the disciples came to Jesus and said, This is a remote place. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Verse 16, Jesus replied, They do not need to go away You give them something to eat. Verse 17, we have here only five loaves of bread and two drumsticks. I mean, two fish. (laughs) Bring them here to me. Now, that story is told more in depth in the Gospel of John. So let's turn to John chapter 6, 1 through 14, and read the whole story in John's view. Now remember again, as you're turning to the Gospel of John, and this is the chapter we're going to be looking at in our Wesley groups next week. In the Gospel of John, um, or excuse me, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, remember, are the synoptic Gospels. They have given a synopsis of Jesus' life from the beginning to the end. And John is not decorated that way at all. Remember, John just picks topics of Jesus' life. He didn't even go to his birth. You remember, he starts right away in Jesus being the Son of God and the eternal life. And I mean, it's just a fascinating study in the Gospel of John written many years later. We've discussed that before. But John gives a whole different angle of this same story. Some of the stories in the Synoptic Gospels are in John. Some are not. This one happens to be. Chapter 6, verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw miraculous signs that he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now, look at the discussion. Just think of that now. All right, Philip, look at all these people coming. It's going to be supper time here in a minute. What are we going to do? Verse 6, he asked this only to test him, which if he tested Philip, he'll test you. He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. So how did Philip do on the test, the uh, pop quiz? Philip answered him, verse 7, eight months' wages, Jesus, would not buy enough bread for each one to even have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother. Now, I love this part. You don't hear much about Andrew, but when G- he was one of the first ones that came to Jesus. And when he hears Jesus, he's one of the very first. He, it, it looks like he was one of John the Baptist's disciples and follows Jesus. So when he's with Jesus, you know, as soon as he hears him and his heart is moved, he goes and gets his brother Peter. I love that. He goes and gets his brother Peter. Well, Andrew speaks up, and what does he say? Verse 9, and it's only in John that you find this part of the story out. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two fish. But how far will they go among so many? In the Synoptic Gospels, it just says that they have this stuff, and what are you going to do about it? In this one, it explains how it came about. Here is a boy... Did the boy offer that? Did the boy, when they're starting looking around, you know, they're going to get something to eat? Did, did the boy offer that? I mean, how did that even come about? It's, that's a fascinating study. Jesus said in verse 10, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. And the men sat down, about 5,000 of them, the men, 
Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and I'm assuming everybody closed their eyes because this is when the miracle takes place. So if you don't close your eyes before you eat, no miracles take place. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. Now, he only has a little bit. So how's this happening? He did the same thing with the fish. Verse 12, when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. They would have, they would have paraded him right into to, uh, Galilee and then into Jerusalem and made him king. But that's not, that's not his intention. He knew that. Okay. Now, this is the word of God for the people of God. Questions. Why do you think, and you can just yell this out, why do you think there were 12 baskets left? 12 disciples. Exactly. I believe that with all my heart. And I think there's a teaching in that. I think that God is trying to say, because I think every one of these, there's a specific teaching. God is trying to say, if you do what I want you to do, there will always be enough for you. I will always provide enough for you. But sometimes you don't get it until you do it. <laughs> you know, there, the, the five loaves and the two fish was not enough for the 12 disciples to eat. You know, that's two little drumsticks and five biscuits at KFC. That is not enough for 12 hungry, hungry men. You know, they needed one of them man witches, you know, it wasn't enough. But when they do what God wants them to do in faith, then there's enough for each of them. And their baskets, everybody carried baskets or bags. It was like backpacks back then. It's how you carried your belongings for the day. I mean, remember, they're on long journeys. It's where you kept your Nike tennis shoes. You just, you kept all that stuff. So they're gathering it. Where do these baskets come? They have the baskets. They have their satchels. They're not actually necessarily baskets, but they're like baskets, you know. Jim? Well, it my Bible says that he blessed them and he distributed it. Yes. He didn't, it doesn't say he gave them to disciples, but he, they, but he must have. Well, yeah, exactly. To, I mean, and just being rational about, you know, you've got 5,000 people. He blessed them. And so I, I don't, and he must have given it to the 12 to start passing out. But he starts it out. That's why I said I believe that everybody must have closed their eyes. I mean, how does that happen? I mean, you're looking at it and just all of a sudden, you know. Uh, something else that's happening here in that process. What is Jesus saying by doing that miracle? What, what comes to your mind? Anybody? Any, I mean, what, what just stands out? Pardon me? He will, provide. he will provide, exactly. But what else is he saying? Anything else? Little Say it again. Little is, Little is much, exactly. Say it again. Have faith, exactly. But what does it say about Jesus? I'm trying to pull it. What does it say about Jesus? In the very back, Aggie? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let him take the microphone because you'll be the star on the, uh, on the website this week. <laughs> Go ahead, Aggie. I think he was saying, trust me. Yes, yes. But what is he saying about who he is? Think about this now. What is he actually doing? Georgia, go ahead. I didn't hear you. He's our provider. He is our provider. Jehovah Jireh, exactly. But what, what is going on here? Think, think of the miracle. Who can do this? Jesus. But take Jesus out of the picture for a minute. Who can do this? God. Think about this now. You to have fit. What do you got to do? Fish. Fish got to come from somewhere. They got to have a mommy and daddy. <laughs> they got. They got to. They got to be. Uh, they got to be a romantic moment between mom and daddy <laughs> for the fish to be here. You know, to to have bread. What do you got to do? You got to plant, right? And then you got to have sunshine. You got to have rain. And you got to have the growth. And you got to let the weeds and the tares grow together. Remember, we talked about that in one of the parables. You got to let it grow up. And then what do you got to do? You got to go out in there and till it, you know? And then you got to pluck the wheat. And then you got to sift the wheat, all right? And then when you got the wheat, you got to go there and you got to grind the wheat. 
And then the wheat, because we used to do this, Nancy and I, you got to grind the wheat. You remember when we used to make the bread? I mean, we'd get these big kernels of wheat and the grinding machine, grinding, grinding, grinding. You know, you grind the wheat. Charlie knows well. He did that many times for us. You know, you grind that wheat and then you gotta, you're in the process of making the bread and you got to make it rise. And then, and then when you got to make it rise, you know, then you got to cook it. And, and then you, when you have it cooked and you got to let it warm, you know, on the hearth and then you deliver it. None of this is happening. None of this is happening. This is, this is just boom. <laughs> this is just, you know, fish, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, who cooked it? I mean, brought the fish. That's the thing. Only God can do this. There's, there's no harvest. There's no seed time. There's no planting. There's no fishing. There's no romantic moment. There's none of these things. That, that The only way this can happen is that Jesus is God. He speaks his blessing, and it just happens. Okay? This isn't an evolving moment. This is a creation moment. Now think of that. Now, you know, you that say that might struggle as we talked before about creation, like how did God create the world in six days? Forget that. How did he create these fish like that? Just like that. You know, there is, there's no Mommy and daddy in the ocean. <laughs> I don't want to get any more clear than that, you know? I mean, he just, he speaks the blessing. I know from now on when you pray, you're going to want to keep one eye open. Aren't you going to say, I want to see what God's going to do. You know, how, I, what I can't get over in this miracle is, you know, how do they, they're watching this and how is it happening? You know, how's he just, I love Hollywood. You know, they come up with all kinds of funny ways to try to show that. I just wonder how in the world, you know, everybody, it must have been like, did they fall from the sky? You know, where did it come from? Yes, Jerry? Go ahead. What is the significance of it not mentioning fish left over? Only the bread, 12 baskets of bread. Because <laughs> <laughs> it smelled. That's, <laughs> that's what my wife Nancy would say. Anybody want no fish anyway? That was why. You know, I don't know. Was it uh, because there were fewer? I mean, fewer I, fish. Honestly, I don't know. That is interesting. That Jerry is asking, you know, why isn't there fish left over? I'm not sure. Um, why is that? Yeah, Holly's got a question in the very back, Dale. I don't, I don't, I don't know. That's interesting. I know that, you know, if, if I hope the 12 didn't need to be gluten-free because that would have messed them up too, you know. Does this, <laughs> Holly? Does this have anything to do with uh, God providing manna for the people when they ah, were in Egypt? Ah, good connection. Remember how we said every story of the Old Testament has its connection in the New Testament? And then, of course, the idea... Maybe that, ah, let's run with that. Maybe the idea, the manna that they received uh, in the Old Testament, do y'all remember that? In the 40 days, or I mean 40 years, they're in the wilderness, they have none to eat, and when they get up in the morning, there's manna on the ground, little nuggets of bread. And uh, there is some research that shows there's actually trees over in that part of the world that produce a, a little thing that you can eat, that, and they call it manna. And so some people said, oh, that's probably what it was. But that concept came from the area where they were and the idea that manna had been there before. You know, I mean, it, but people look at that differently. Um, remember, they were to pick six days a week that manna have enough to have for breakfast in the morning. Uh, I mean, through the day, they had to, you know, trust on the Sabbath. You know, you were not to gather on the Sabbath. You know, so they had to leave that alone. Saturday morning, they were not allowed to gather for the day. There was always enough. And if, and if they, I mean, they had to just trust. And if they, if they did, somebody help me out. I'm getting the story backwards. If they did too much, how's it go, Ray? Wait, wait for the microphone so you can explain it. Every day at evening, the manna was spoiled. Okay. You get right, and there the words come in. And then the, on Saturday, they would prepare for the next day, Sunday, and exactly. it would not spoil it hang over. Exactly. There you go. In other words, that, that if, they, if they hung over with it, it would spoil, but on the Sabbath, it would stay fresh so that they could use it and not pick it. Excellent. So that manna is the concept of the Old Testament that God provides that you lift it up. And then in the New Testament, we have the idea that Jesus, the word of life, can speak, just create the manna. And then in the Gospel of John a little bit later on, he makes it clear that he is the manna or the bread, tying in with what Holly said, that came down from heaven. He is the bread of life and you must eat of me, you know. And you know what was an interesting thing apart that, about that as well when Jesus teaches that? And that's where the, the Catholic Church pulls the concept 
of the body and blood becoming, you know, actually the body and blood of Christ. Because Jesus said, you must eat my body and drink my blood. He said that. And a lot of the uh, people left him. You remember? Actually, it follows suit. If you continue to read in John, that's what it says. They left him because of that. Because they were like, oh gosh, he's getting into, you know, and the disciples come up to Jesus and they say, Jesus, you know, everybody's leaving. You know, why do you have to say these kind of things? You know, and Jesus said, they're only following me because they want another free meal. That's just what he said. They just want another free, they're bumming off me, disciples, you know. And then he looks at his disciples and you lose this in the English translation. He said, but you're not going to leave me, are you? Now, when you read that, when you study that on, it gives the idea almost like Jesus is thinking, hmm, you know. But always, and you've heard me mention this before, when you expect a yes or no answer, in, when you write in Greek, in Koine Greek in the New Testament, the author that's writing puts down what the person's feeling was, yes or no. It's right there in the text. And so what Jesus says is, you're not going to leave me, are you? I know you're not. But you lose that. In the English translation. Go ahead, Bill. Is it Bill or Shirley? Go ahead. To get back to the fish. They didn't have any refrigerators. That's true. Or any thermoses. Uh, The fish would be spoiled the next day. That's true. That's true. Because they had not been salted. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's what holds fish. So they had not been salted. They were fresh. And God didn't salt them. Maybe that's the answer. He didn't salt them. That's good. Yeah, John? Don't forget, they had drumsticks, too. Remember the coil came. <laughs> That's right, John. Yeah, why do they need fish? They had drumsticks. Exactly. <laughs> God sent quail. They did. Yeah, you're right. That was the next, the next, a little bit after that, he sent the quail. They did have drumsticks. They literally did. Yes, Jerry? Who was it that ran away from Jezebel when she threatened to kill him? And he ran away to the caves, and he was provided with food. He was provided. God always provides. You're right. And again, that goes back, let's end with that. That ends with the concept, again, that maybe we were intended to be Israel's refuge. Maybe so. I mean, I, I would not, I've not studied it enough to hold 100% to that. But just looking at this and trying to make a scientific hypothesis, you know, which is just an educated guess, you, you weigh your ducks, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. Interesting study tonight. We're going to pick up next week. Go back to Matthew uh, for just a minute. I love the story. We're going to pick up next week, Matthew chapter 14, starting with verse 22, where Jesus walks on the water. And I love that passage. Um, just so if you, if you want to prepare. Um, and I love the story, and I've used it many times in sermons about why did Peter take his eyes off Jesus? And why do we take our eyes off Jesus? Why do we do that? You know, he calls us to come, and yet something makes us take our eyes off Jesus. And then when we get into chapter 15, uh, he explains about what really makes a person unclean. And remember how that, and we'll bring this up again next week, that the Old Testament, you could take all the 613 laws, which includes the Ten Commandments, and divide them into three areas, the ceremonial laws, the dietary laws, and the moral laws. You can divide all of those commandments. Honestly, you can if you could just go through them. They fall into those three categories. And in the New Testament is the connection again. Two of those three are removed, and one of them is the idea of the dietary laws, which is lifted up in that chapter, chapter 15 of Matthew. And then we see where the ceremonial laws are removed as well in another chapter, but we've lifted up before the moral laws. We cannot seem to find any place, and yet we're changing morality, but the Word has not changed morality, which is interesting. Okay? All righty. Well, let's pray. And then, folks, you're going. Again, I encourage you, if you've got a few minutes, the Wesley group, we're going to be tackling chapter 5 of uh, John, and that'll be a good discussion in there, and then praying for each other. Um, and I've got, actually, I've got to run to my office and get my magazines. Uh, Irene and Ray, if you'll hold the group in there. We have got uh, magazines from Sam Rankin. And if you haven't got one of these, we need to get you one of these about Voice of the Martyrs. And it's got all the persecuted areas in our globe right now. There's a, there's a pullout. And I've got one for everybody in the classes. And, and uh, we're going to really be praying for them. And I've got some ideas how we can raise funds for the children 
of those martyrs, the refugees and many of those. And uh, we're going to do that in the fall. I've got all kinds of ideas about that. And that's going to be spearheaded by these small groups. So again, if you've got just a few minutes tonight, step in there and let me share with you. And, uh, and then we'll pray together. Trustees, again, are going to meet over in the office. Can we stand for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you again so much for all that you give to us. May your blessings be upon us. Father, just guide us. Thank you for these wonderful discussions. It is so great to take an hour and just study your word. New revelations come to us, just like the concept that we ended with tonight on the manna from heaven, the Old Testament story relating that to the New Testament, then relating that to us, that you will always provide. And if you have always provided for us, are you also always providing for the Jewish community? And is it a possibility, as we've studied tonight, that America was to help protect the Jewish community? Right or wrong, the Jewish community, they, they have a lot of sins like the rest of us. No one, everyone has blood on their hands. We know that everybody is guilty, all have sinned. But was that part of your protection plan is the United States of America? And if it is, Lord, how are we doing? How are we doing with that? We just ask you guide us as we go our separate ways. Those, again, in the Wesley groups, trustees, other groups that may be meeting tonight, just take care of everybody, their family, their friends. Lord, I pray especially for Virginia Lee's family. Those of you in the spirit of prayer that were here Sunday at 11, their, her family was here. She was still alive this morning. She's very close to going on to be with Jesus. Uh, she turned 100 today. So, Lord, we just ask a blessing on that family. And we pray especially for Joey Weisbaum. We know that she has had a rough week. We continue to intercede for her and pray for your blessings in her life. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, and all of God's people said...